I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm in the building. I don't know where to start. You know, should I just start talking and? You knock yourself out. Tell us how you did it, cause you got some folks in here, sports okay. and entertainment management, and they want to do what you're doing. So this is this is a sports and entertainment management class. No, this is first year business first seminar, year but business. some of the concentrations are, okay. and they aspire to start their own business or get into entertainment or gotcha. get in. Yeah. How many people in here want to get into entertainment? Told you. <laughs> how many people want to, want to get into sports? How many people want to get into management? I mean, people just want to be into business overall. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and tell my story a little bit. I'm originally from Philly. Um, I was born and raised in Philly, and I actually, um, I became a DJ when I was um, in high school. Um, anybody familiar with the movie Juice with Tupac? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I, I went to go see that movie, and the character GQ that Omar Epps played was a DJ in that movie, and I was, I was like, ooh, that's, that looks fun. That's something I want to do, so. I convinced my mom to buy me like one turntable, and um, I would I would save up my lunch money, and uh, I would go downtown, go downtown Philadelphia, and just you know go buy records every day. So and I started doing little uh, little parties in Philly, like um, high school parties, and making mixtapes, and w which were actually cassette tapes at the time. Um, I hate to show my age, but um, they were little uh, mixtapes and so forth. I would sell them on my locker and what have you. Fast forward a couple years later. Um, I got into uh, Clark Atlanta University, and I came to school down here, and um, I stayed at, which is now at the Funk, which is no more of a Brawley Hall, and uh, I met a couple friends of mine who were also DJs and what, and what have you, and um, I was a mass media major at the time, um, but what, what, what always stuck out to me or, or um, what, what always was important out of all my classes, because I felt like a lot of what I learned and a lot of what I took from the, my time being here in the AUC, specifically in, uh, in CAU, but, but just in general, was a lot of the relationships that I made, a lot of the friends that I had, and, and just, you know, the, the time in the classroom was very important, but the time out of the classroom was probably even, um, even more important. Um, but one thing I do remember more than anything was I had this marketing class at the time, and we discussed the four P's. Does anybody remember the four P's? <laughs> Price, product, Price, promotion, product, promotion and, uh, and placement. And um, that was key to me because around that time, I used to, in between my classes, there's a, um, across the street from where the, the library is, there used to be a, a bookstore um, upstairs called Audrey's, which like everybody used to come to. Jay-Z used to be there, Nas used to be there. Like anybody who was anybody would, would, would have to come through campus and they would come to that bookstore because she would sell um, she would sell everybody's albums, and in the basement there was the, um, a little sandwich shop that I worked at. So in between classes, I used to always sell my, my mixtapes and just set up on campus and what have you. You know, people would know me, and some people wouldn't know me, and you know, I would, I would have like just various uh, tapes set up and, and, and what have you. And, and um, that marketing class, um, I, I was able to apply it to what I was doing at the time because it made so much sense to me because it was about product, it was about placement, it was about pricing. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, outside of what the entertainment aspect of what I'm doing right now, you know, I'm, I'm able to apply what I'm learning out as marketing classes because that's basically what I'm doing. I'm marketing my mixtapes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm setting the prices, I'm, I'm, I'm um, taking um, advantage of the placement, you know, and making sure my product was good and so, so forth and what have you. And so, um, you know, that, that always stuck into my head even as I was going through school, you know, that there's certain things about the entertainment industry or, you know, or, or just a lot of in, um, industries in general that, you know, you can learn in school, but one thing that, that crosses all paths all the time is business, you know what I'm saying? Because you can be the greatest entertainer, you can be the greatest athlete, you can be the, you know, the greatest um, uh, 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 doctor or um physicist for an athlete or what have you, physician for an athlete, but you know, if your business is not intact, then it's, it's not gonna make no difference. Somebody with some great business uh, um, astutes or, or um, skills is, is, is normally gonna be able to take it a little higher than the next person. So um, um, during, the, during those years, you know, I, I spent a lot of time for myself, you know, I had, I had uh, odd jobs here and there, you know, I, I spent a little time working at, uh, working at Atlantic's and, and working at 
very slow odds and jobs, but I, I used to tell myself that, you know, no matter what I did during the day, whether it was, you know, the time I spent in class to, you know, what, how much time I had to go work somewhere, I always, I always made sure that I gave a couple of hours of the day to myself and to what I was really focused on, you know. Um, and I, I think from, like me, I never technically felt like I was a, a nine to five type of person, so, and, and nor did I know where, you know, <clears throat> my career was going to take me at the time or, or, or where I would be, you know, if I would able ever accomplish the things that I, I've accomplished to this day and the things that I still look forward to accomplishing. So um, around the same time, you know, I, I met a group of friends. Um, one is named uh, DJ Sense, who went to CAU with me, another is named Don Cannon. And um, we were all from Philly. We all aligned, and we all had something in common, which for the most part was DJing. And um, we kind of just, uh, outside of just befriending each other, just, you know, early on, I guess, in a sense, we were starting our own business. You know, little did we know where it was going to take us. Um, I graduated from school. I, I did four years. I got out and got done. Um, at the time, I was working at CNN for a little bit. And thankfully, right as I graduated, they laid me off. And I say thankfully because, you know, I don't know where I would be if I would have had to have kept that job. Because it was at the time, it was a good paying job. It was an easy job. But, you know, they. When they laid me off, I said, okay, I gotta figure out, you know, what I'm gonna do next. So I spent the like the next two years, three years out of school, uh, pretty much still going on my own, you know, hustling my own mixtapes. I would go to Georgia State, I would go to Emory, I would come back here to CAU, and I would like uh, set a table up and I had to, I would have like various types of music, you know, on, on each mixtape, and people would be like, who's DJ Drama? Like, they would come up to me, I would be the one selling the CDs, and they'd be like, Who, who's DJ Drama? I'd be like, well, I don't know, I just work for him. He told me to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, if you'd be like, that's me, then people would look at you like, oh, I'm going, I'm buying your tape, I'm going down the street. So, I just made it as if, you know, I was working for the guy who was the, the man, and, you know, and um, it was, um, you know, I, I guess I've always kind of been somewhat of a people person, so, you know, personality goes a long way, and I and interact with people, and I tried to make sure that um, my product looked good more than anything, too, so before they even got a chance to listen to it, you know, it, it was um, appealing to the eye. And um, and so, you know, that, that went well for me for a couple of years. Um, I did that, and I would, you know, again, like I said, I would go to Georgia State and do the same thing, and people weren't, didn't really know me, and I, like my, it, it almost happened in the sense where <clears throat> I felt like, and, and this happens in a lot of ways, you know, I started off in a small central point, like, you know, for the most part, in, in my time when I went to school here, like everybody knew, like DJ Drama was the, the go-to guy, you know, I used to do Market Fridays, I used to be in the cafeteria, I would do, you know, the door. Is, is, is Bumstead still over there? Yeah, it's close. Okay, okay, well, Bumstead, damn, everything's changed around. That's crazy. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I would do whatever whatever it was needed. I mean, from weddings to wh whatever, you know. So, but people always knew, like, you know, when it came to the AUC, like, who's, who's the man? If it wasn't me, it was Canon. If it wasn't Canon, it was Sense. And um, I, I, I just realized that, you know, to take my career and, and keep it, keep it moving, it was like, you know, you, you, had to, um, you had to start, you know, you had to start from where you were and just kind of start branching out and, and making your way, you know, until it became a, it was a very centralized local thing to a, to a larger local thing, to a national thing, to um, an international thing. Um, so <clears throat> around the same time was when I originally met T.I who was a brand new artist at the time. Um, he had just signed his first record deal and um, we sparked up an um, a early friendship, you know, myself, him and his manager. And as he was doing his thing, I was doing my thing. And you know, one thing about like hip hop that I knew and I knew a long time ago was that, you know, there was always something special about a, the DJ and the MC collaboration, you know, we can take it back to um, Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff, you know, um, um, you see it right now with Future Esco, you know, it's just, <clears throat> I knew as a DJ, you know, if there's an artist that you could 
align yourself with, it would help. It would help um, in a lot of senses for, for for my brand and to be noticed and and you know um, to be able to just you know branch out and do a lot of things. So um, I, I became Tips DJ um, around these years after school, <coughs> and while I was doing that. Um, I guess around the same time when I was doing mixtapes, you know, I used to really kind of, because I was um, like pushing them myself or selling them myself, I would I would always try to make sure to have something for for all the consumers. So I used to make like an R&B tape, I used to have like a neo soul tape. I would have like a, a reggae tape, I would, you know, like a, a what what was then known as like you know up north east coast hip hop and everything. And, you know, at the time it was then known as like you know down south, I guess. So I remember um, an opportunity presented itself when I needed to do a new South mixtape and I, I needed a new name for it. So I was just kind of like sitting around in my house brainstorming, thinking of you know what to call it and throwing around words and, and, and so forth. And, and I said to my man since, I was like, you know, what about Gangsta Grills? And he was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Like, you know, let's call it Gangsta Grills. So <clears throat> I, I made a tape called Against Grills that had no host. It was, you know, the girls with an S, which is, you know, later became Z, but um, it was that it was the actual first Gangsta Grills mixtape. And um, <clears throat> from that, you know, I, I um I, I, I continued on and I kept doing like part one, part two, part three, four, five, six, whatever. Um, Tip and his manager came to me with the opportunity to uh, to do a certain style of tape, and around these around these times, you know, um, um, certain artists hosting a mixtape and you know it having a certain sound. But that was a real, real like East Coast tri-state area type of thing. Like it wasn't like that in the South at the time, you know. Because I remember when I was doing what I was doing, people were telling me like, "Yo, don't talk on your tapes. You know, just play the music they know." You know, they don't want to hear any freestyles, any exclusives, and I pretty, you know, me being from Philly, you know, I came up a certain way, so, <clears throat> and I was really a, I was really a fan of the music that was going around at the time, which was people like Tip, which was people like Jeezy, or well, still kind of early on Jeezy, but, uh, you know, just more than just what people were associating with, like, crunk music or songs like White Tea or, or stuff like that, and not to take away from those songs, but it was just like, okay, I see that, you know, Southern Hip Hop is more than that. So I apply, I, I basically applied a, a East Coast formula to South music, you know, and I had like people like Tip and host the tape, and you know, it would, it would be like just a lot of exclusive music, and mm, it, it kind of caught on, you know, and I remember when I was young, DJ Clue was like the biggest thing to me, and, and feeling like, yo, you know, I made it if you if I if somebody drives down the street and and they hear um you know I hear my name coming out of somebody's car so you know at this point when me and Tip hooked up and we started doing mixtapes it was like that's when I had kind of you know felt at the time I had broken my 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 glass ceiling you know because it was the most you know sought after thing in in the city you know for the most part and for a lot of the southern regions um, after that. Um, this guy took me to lunch, uh, his name was Coach K, and he, um, he had this guy with him named Young Jeezy, who lived around the corner from me, but had never put anything out, and he told me, you know, I, I have this vision, you know, I, I really want to do this project with you, and <clears throat> it's going to be the, your biggest tape ever, and I was like, okay, yeah, right, whatever, and um, <laughs> we hooked up, and uh, we put out his tape, and he was right, you know, it became one of the most... One, it, it was a life changer for me. Um, we did one tape called Streets is Watching, <clears throat> which was huge, and then we came back and did a tape called Trapper Die, which pretty much like changed all of our lives, my life, his life, and a lot of people around us. And I remember at the time I was still on the road with T.I., and um, I couldn't go to no city anywhere, whether it was Chicago, whether it was Philly, whether it was L.A., and not hear that tape or hear myself. So. So by this point, you know, I kind of become um, somewhat of a, you know, a, a household name within hip hop. Um, you know, my, my mixtapes were everywhere and, you know, life was good and, you know, um, my, my, my company was doing good and, 
you know, magazines were calling me and asking to put me on the cover, and you know, it just, it was, I felt like I had made it. I was, I was on. I was, I was good. And every artist in the world was calling me to do mixtapes. I, I then went on to do a tape of Wayne called Dedication, and you know, that was that even because I used to the, the type of person that I am. I always challenge myself, like whatever I did yesterday, <clears throat> that doesn't matter. You know, I, I appreciate the accolades, I appreciate the love, but that was yesterday. What is it's what's about? What am I going to do tomorrow? You know what I'm saying? Because you know, everybody in this room or everybody on this campus is is, is hungry for success. You know what I'm saying? So, by I, I'm the type of person, regardless of how old you are or what you've accomplished, and, you know, and I and, and that's not to say that. I don't re pay respect to those who come before me or, 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 or um, show, you know, show appreciation. But for me, regardless of what I did, I still have tomorrow to prove myself again and again and again. <clears throat> so that's how I would, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how I would pretty much approach my, <clears throat> my, um, my own career. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I went, I then went on to, you know, do, do various projects with, with various artists from, from all over. I mean. You name it, I've probably done a tape with them or worked with them in some aspect. Around this time, I got my my first um, official like uh, major label album deal with Atlantic Records, and um, I signed my deal. And I um, about 2007. Um, it was it was 2007. It was I think it was January 16th to 17th. Um, uh, it was right after MLK. I had an office around the corner from here on Walker Street. Um, we had about 15, 16 employees in there. Uh, we used to keep all of our mixtapes in there. You know, we had our studio in there. We had a radio show that we did from the studio. And um, I walked outside. Next thing I know, it was, it was 30 cops surrounding the building with M16 rifles, you know, pointed at my head and told me to get on the ground. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? And, me and Cannon were outside, and they put us on the ground, and I'm, I'm, I'm just knowing it's a mistake. It's like, maybe they're coming for the guys down the street who hustle weed or something. It's not for me, like, you know what I'm saying? So they ask my name, and I tell them Tyree Simmons, and then they, uh, you know, they get it, they get on the, uh, the little walkie-talkies, like, oh, Tyree Simmons? Yeah, that's one of the perps. And I'm like, sitting there like, oh shit, like, <laughs> like what? So um, they, they stood me and Cannon up, and they, uh, they they read me my romant what is it called um, Miranda rights Miranda rights and um and they said you know Tyree Simmons you're you're under arrest for bootlegging and racketeering under the RICO law so basically they they charged me with bootlegging and racketeering mixtapes and you know one thing about me or 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 any of the of the music that I've ever put out has always been you know in coordinates with either the artist the label the management or something you know I've never bootlegged a mixtape or CD a, a record or anything. So <clears throat> they, they, they raided our whole building, you know, and again, you know, we had 15 employees, probably 10 of them had just started. Some of them had, were, were from the schools, you know, and here's, you know, the cops coming in here with these big ass assault rifles telling them, you know, where the guns, where the drugs, <clears throat> tell, us, tell us now and we'll let you go. And, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a horrifying experience at the time. And I was shook out of my mind. And, you know, I'm like, what, I'm a college graduate. I'm a, you know, a great citizen of Atlanta. Why? What, what, what's going on? <laughs> you know. So, um, um, so basically, you know, they, they arrested me under the RICO law, which the RICO law is the law that they give to like crime bosses. Like Al Capone got the RICO law. Like I wouldn't be surprised if BMF got the RICO law. Like I'm a DJ. I what the fuck are y'all talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so later on, they they had a um, a thing on the news that night and. Um, you know, they, they went over the whole case, like big DJs from Atlanta get arrested and they show me in Cannon's um, um, uh, mug shots and everything. And, and then one of the guys, one of the police officers even does a report and he says, you know, you know, normally in these situations when we go in and we find bootleggers and so forth, we normally find an abundance of guns and drugs. But in this situation, we did, which was so crazy to me. I'm like, you talk about what you normally find, but you didn't find in here. I mean, it was not, not a, not a joint, not a handgun, no nothing was in the building, you know, so it was nothing but CDs. So um, they, uh, so we, we wound up going to court for it. Um, the charges were brought down later and, um, you know, a lot of it was in conjunction with the, um, the IRAA, you know, who runs the recording industry, 
and some of their practices. But you know, at the time, I was like <clears throat> top of the food chain when it came to DJs and mixtapes and everything. So you know, it's it, it set the whole industry pretty much scattered. You know, like almost fearful. You know, what I'm saying of if it, it happened to drama, it happened to anybody. So um, things started to change around that time. And this was around the time when you know the internet was was becoming very prevalent in how people were gaining you know access to new music. You know what I'm saying? It was you know blogs were were, were almost becoming the new mixtapes. You know if y'all remember even before like um, um, before you know some of the websites. You know people used to just post up links on Twitter and say here's my mixtape. You know what I'm saying? So things were kind of changing around this time. It's, because of what was happening to me as or what had happened to me as well as just technology was taking you know things into a new direction and you know I'll argue with anybody today that <clears throat> mixtapes are probably bigger than they ever were because of the um, the accessibility to them so I spent a day in jail um, um, got out um, next thing you know it was around the time when uh, I think the Super Bowl <clears throat> excuse me Super Bowl was in Miami and you know, at just being in an entertainment um, business, you know, these are some a lot of the events that you know we go to a lot because I I, I work, I have work and, and gigs and so forth. And I just remember walking down the street, and you know, at the time, um, I, I had a certain fan base, like people knew me. But then after that arrest, it was like a lot of people knew me, and I, you know. And I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Like this, they kind of made me more famous. And um, I had a conversation with Billboard magazine, maybe. Couple, couple months before the raid, and you know, I, they they wanted they had asked me to do something, and, and I said, hey, how about you give me a cover? And they was like, we well, don't put DJs on the cover, like mm -hmm. talking about. After the raid, they said, okay, you give us the exclusive, we'll put you on the cover. And I was like, bet this is working out, you know. So around the same time, um, um, my record label, who were also, I guess, somewhat into what was going on was saying that, you know, to take advantage of um, of the, um, the free press almost, because that's pretty, pretty much what it, what it was. So I put my first album out um, December 4th, 2007. That was my first major label album. And um, it did pretty well. Um, I had records on there with, with, you know, you name it. One of my favorites was a song with Outkast, which, you know, not a lot of people can say they, they actually had a record with Outkast. Um, I went on to, you know, I, um, I have a show on Sirius Satellite. I have a show here on Hot 1079, um, uh, syndication radio, and, and, and various things. Around the same time, I branched off from being TI's DJ, and I just started to, um, to, to do my own gigs and do my own events and start kind of just traveling on my own and, you know, um, and, and just start expanding you know my um, my uh, my my various means of of of, of uh, fi finances and or just businesses in, in so many ways. And um, you know, one of the things that I, I started was uh, uh, I started building a studio called Main Street Studios, which um, I pretty much started from scratch. You know, I'm, I had moved out of my own studio, and, and, and uh, we found a building, and we pretty much gutted it out and, and built it from room to room. You know, which is um, I started with my radio room since that was, you know, where most of my um, my income was coming at the time. And from the radio room, we went on to build a, a studio, and you know, and now we have three studio lounge, a, a psych wall for photographers and for videographers, and um, amongst various other things. And, and while I was doing this, well, at, the, at the same time, you know, I began to still continue to put out my own records, and um, I put a record out in. 2010, 2011, called Oh My, it was Fab and it was Khalifa, which, which at the time had been my biggest record, and it, it, it went top 20. So um, that was, and, and with that, it started to, you know, people started to take, take a little more notice. I got another record deal from that situation, and put out two more albums. Then I did another record called My Moment um, with uh, um, Two Chains, Jeremiah, and Meek. Which went gold, and from that, from after that experience happened, where when I did that record, you know, I had a, a friend over at Atlantic, which who I used to be signed with, and I brought to him the idea about um, me possibly coming in and being an A and R, um, and A and R at a record label is someone who you know is kind of helps find talent, you know, um, 
if somebody's hot in the region, you know, they're the first person to say, hey, look, you guys might want to check this guy out. Or also, just in general, just someone who's, you know, in the studio and day in and day, day out, just kind of helping with, with music and projects or giving input or, or and things of that nature. So I, um, I got the opportunity to, um, to, I got the job as an A&R at Atlantic, which was um, something, something new for me, you know, because it was one thing where I was kind of um, running my own career, but it was an opportunity that for me to be in an executive mode and, and be behind the boards and, you know, start helping find a new talent and, and bring things to the table and, and so forth. And, and part of the way I, I, I structured that deal was I also made Atlantic come in and help me um, build out the rest of the industry studio. So they gave me X amount of dollars and I was able to complete the building, not using my money, but using their money um, to finish it up, which was, you know, which was the most made the greatest thing ever because nobody wants to use your own money when you don't have to you use somebody else's money. Um, I went on to sign an artist named Lil Uzi Vert, um, who's originally from Philly, and um, uh, my man Cannon brought him to the table. Myself and uh, uh, Lake Show and my man Pat back there. You know, we started a new company called Generation Now, and um, we signed Uzi to that company and then signed him to Atlantic and. You know, just like one thing about it, like, and for me telling you this story, like, a lot of things that stick out in my head, <clears throat> like, there was a lot of times and a lot of lot of goals and visions that I had. Like, originally when I first started DJing, my only goal ever was to get my name on a flyer. You know, when I was <laughs> anybody from Philly in here? Okay, I, I went to Central High School, so when I would go up to the um, to the bus stop every day. They would always give out flyers, and I'm like, man, I want, I want to, before everybody I would just go to Instagram and see a flyer, like people had paper flyers, and I was like, you know, I just want to get, I just want to get my name on a flyer. That was my only goal. And then, you know, I remember telling somebody at at the time, like, you know, they were like, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to be in a magazine. I want somebody to write an article about me. And somebody was like, why would they write an? What's there to write an article about you for? And I hence went on to be in plenty of magazines, and. Um, um, then I remember, you know, when I started Gangsta Grills, you know, I, everything that I did on Gangsta Grills from, you know, that, um, does anybody ever heard one of my mixtapes in here? Right. Some people think I'm really annoying. It's cool. I, it's all good. But, you know, they, 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 for some reason, they still want me to talk on the tapes. So, you know, they told me don't talk on the tapes, you know, don't play new music, don't do this, don't do that. That's not what people like. And I, I did everything they told me that people didn't like. And, you know, it worked. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, it got me to this point. Um, what, what was I saying? Why, why did I get there? Oh, and so <laughs> going to the step forward, you know, um, even when I signed Uzi, you know, who we, we kind of helped groom in a lot of ways, who he's an exceptional talent on his own. Um, but as a new artist, you know, we, um, he's originally from Philly. We, we kind of brought him to Atlanta, you know, just to work with us. And I remember my record label telling me, like, you know, like, you know, drum, like, when it comes to hip hop, you know, everything has to happen in somebody's backyard. Like, an artist breaks in their backyard. Like, you know, if, if, if you're hot, if you're from here, you gotta be hot here. Like, if you're from Philly, you gotta be hot in Philly. If you're from Atlanta, you gotta be hot in Atlanta. Like, you know, we can take Future as an example, Thug, whoever, so forth. You know, you, you get hot in your city, and then, you know what I'm saying? And then everybody else starts paying attention. And I said, I beg to differ. Like, you know, that's the, that's the old way of thinking about it. You know, and I, I gave him some examples. I said, J. Cole's from Fayetteville. J. Cole didn't get hot in Fayetteville. You know what I'm saying? J. Cole got hot a lot of places. Um, Wiz Khalifa. Wiz Khalifa's from Pittsburgh. Like, and I used to go to Pittsburgh all the time and ask who's hot. They didn't say Wiz Khalifa. They said Gucci Man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so, like, I knew that, you know, that's Wiz didn't technically break in his backyard. Another example is Drake. You know, as much as they love him in Toronto, Drake didn't necessarily break in Toronto, you know. He broke on the internet. There was a lot of kids listening to him from a lot of different places. So when they told me that, you know, I took, and these are the bosses, mind you, like the, the people that cut my checks telling me this. So, you know, I, take it, I took it with heed and, 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 and listened. I said, you know, I beg to differ. So we put out a mixtape um, last year around Halloween and, you know, it caught on like wildfire. And I, I went to the same meeting with these same people um, a couple months ago and 
I basically sat in this meeting and had them tell me how hot and amazing Uzi was. And I was like, man, this a bitch. I was just telling me you got to be hot in your backyard. And, you know, here's this, here's this kid who they're listening to him all over the country. And it, it didn't, he wasn't in Philly when it happened. People in Philly like him, but, you know, he's, he's known a lot of places. So, um, and I only say that to say, and, and, it's, and, and it's not to say that don't take the words or take heed of what people tell you, you know, how it has to be done or how it is done. But that doesn't mean that that's, that, your vision or, or how, how you may want to accomplish your goals or your dreams can't be done that way just because somebody else did it another way. Like, that's just not, that's not real. Um, you know, and then I, I'm also like, again, like, I, I'm one that has, through the years, created a lot of brands, whether it's Gangsta Girls, whether it's my own name, DJ Drama, whether it's Mean Street Studios, whether it's Generation Now, you know, it, you know, just so many things, it's like, the power of words is, is always very is, is very important to me. And I just believe that, you know, when I sat there and thought of the words Gangsta Girls, I never would have thought that it would open up so many doors for me or enable me to travel the world or, you know, just work with so many people. So, so many people that I grew, like if somebody would have told me that I could, you know, go to my phone and, and call Snoop or, or call Ice Cube or, or, I mean, these are people that like I grew up on, you know what I'm saying? So, and, and now I consider peers and friends of mine and, you know, and it's just like, if you can think it, it can, it can be accomplished. I mean, it's, it's just that simple and that easy in a lot of ways, as complicated as it, it may seem. I mean, and I use like people in entertainment all the time. I mean, if you look at what Marvel is doing with their with, with the Marvel Universe and, you know, the deal they signed with Disney or, or just the movies that come out every month, I mean, excuse me, every year during the summertime, like, you know, there was at one point, there was a guy with a piece of paper like this, it was blank, and he was drawing out characters of Iron Man and, and, and whoever the rest of them, and now it's a billion dollar industry. Harry Potter is another example, or, you know, going even deeper, just, you know, um, a, a, a woman who, who could put out a cookbook and, you know, from recipes that she may have learned from her grandmother and turn it into a million to a billion dollar industry. I mean, it's, it's just that simple, like the power of, of, of your thoughts can, it, it's, it's unbelievable how far they can take you in so many ways. And, you know, you guys, you know, I, I can only imagine what it has been like in my day if I, when I was in school, or if I had some of the, the perks of, of, you know, things like social media and just, you know, just how, even smaller those things make the world or, or SoundCloud or you know what I'm saying when it comes to music or Spotify to, to, to be able to gain your music. I mean I really had to be there by myself to hustle my own mixtapes, just me, by myself, going home, you know, taping them on my own. I didn't have the you know the, the, the luxury of, of being able to upload something to a computer and, and I think it's great I mean I'm not taking away from none of that I just think it it makes the opportunities just that more broader and wider for people in this room your friends whoever to really to, to get to your goals even faster than before you know and I think like you know even going to school um, um, however how whatever your goals or whatever your, your life decisions take you you know I think everyone would agree, you know, it's more fun or more, it, it's, a, it's a better feeling to be one's own boss than to have to work for someone. Am, am I correct in y'all feel that way? You know, and, and that's like everybody in here can be their own boss. Uh, or technically, if you're not necessarily your own boss, everybody in here is, can probably be in school with somebody else that they can become partners with and you guys can start a company and go on and, 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 and make those six, seven, eight figures that you're supposed to and be able to, you know, do various things for yourself, for your family, for y your friends, for your kids, for, you know, Dr. Kimbrough and, and everything he needs for the classroom and, and so forth. And I, you know, I've been blessed that, um, you know, my man Lake back there, I've known him for 20 years. I mean, we met on campus. He was a rapper. I started beatboxing. He can't rap no more, but, you know, <laughs> but, um, but what he, what, but on a positive note for that, you know, when we were in school, he, by knowing that rap might not be his, um, the, his, his, his career choice of path that would take him to the riches, you know, he found his own niche. He was around an abundance of artists. He was around an abundance of DJs. So he took on to management, you know what I'm saying? I, and and I, I'll tell you now, like, 
I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my managers in the back. I mean, they, they hold me down. We, we bounce around ideas on, from each other all the time. Everybody's not necessarily made to be technically in front of the camera or to be, you know, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the light post, you know. There's a, if there's one light post, there's 10 people around him that, you know, help him succeed and, and gain that. And you hear people like Puff and, and Ellie Reed say this all the time, or, or um, I think uh, this um, gentleman, he also is um, uh, one of my rule managers.